morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world today. Thank you very much for joining us today. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing someone I've got to know over the last, I'm going to say 15 years, but I don't want to age either of us too much, but about over the last 15 years. Someone who has just transitioned from a long-term career and long-term service with a large CRO into a pharma company. So I'm very excited to, to hear about that transition. So Rona, first of all, welcome. Second of all, thank you very much for agreeing to spend a little bit of time with me this morning. Um, and thirdly, perhaps I can let you do a more eloquent introduction of yourself to any of our listeners who may not be so familiar with yourself. Thanks so much, Richard, and thanks for the opportunity for the discussion. I always welcome an opportunity to discuss data management and discuss this industry that you know we're also interested in. So um, I'm Ron O'Donnell. I'm based in Ireland. So as you mentioned, I worked in a large CRO for a long time, almost exclusively within data management. I also worked in uh, clinical risk management as well. Stayed in data management because I loved it and, you know, it's, it's so interesting and I have, you know, wonderful career at a CRO and, um, you know, decided to make a make a life change and, and experience a different uh, working environment, you know, for my own, I guess, education and uh, career progression. So, yeah, big change and, uh, yeah, enjoying it. You are the Vice President of Data Management Systems and Standards. Could you just uh, elaborate a little bit on on what your role is within Novo for us? Sure. So I'm overseeing um, a, a large team that are based in India and also based in Denmark, uh, overseeing the you know data collection, uh, data acquisition, uh, database build in EDC, um, build of uh, DMW, um, and then mapping the data to SDTM and delivery to staff. So all around the data data systems and standards that we use. So. Um, I don't have responsibility for the clinical trial data management, but uh, collaborating very closely on that. So everything from study design all the way through to study submission. Exactly. So you get to feel the pressure on both ends of the process, which is... Good. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's interesting because, you know, that was part of my responsibilities in my previous role. So it's just interesting how some things are so the same, which is a comfort. And then you're just trying to understand, you know, translate how things are in the, in the new company. But uh, a lot of similarity, which is, you know, which is nice and familiar. Yeah. What was data management like when you began your career? Um, any anecdotes or war stories that you would care to share? Just help our audience kind of set the scene of, of where we're going to in the future as well. Yeah, so I mean, it was quite different uh, when I started. I started in 2003 in, you know, the large CRO that I worked in um, and I was a, a contract um, clinical data coordinator. So um, there was a very large uh, CV trial um, that I was, I was taken on as a contract CDC at the start um, and then moved on to different roles as, as a CDC and continue from there. But I worked on a very large cardiovascular trial um, it was in paper. Uh, the CRFs were tracked with MS access. It was double data entered into OC. Yeah. Um, so that was fun. Um, the, but more is that we had like very centralized teams. So um, we had a team that were based in the US. We also had a team in Ireland. And, and there was a huge number of us who sat together and worked on this trial. So I was just really, you know, you forget. Uh, how nice it is to work with a centralized team. So if you had a question, you just turn to your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, there was a real team feeling. Um, and I think if you really reflect on the bandwidth of work that everybody had, it was definitely lower in those days. So you really, you know, had so much time to, you know, spend on the data. And it just, it, it, it was less busy than it is now. Um, but, you know, we had some great fun. I mean, because we were firstly contract CDCs brought in, our job on a Friday was to find the missing CRFs. So you had to spend the day in the filing room looking up different permutations of the subject numbers, trying to find the actual CRFs or, you know, mailing the whole team and asking them, does anyone have this CRF? And nobody answering and then finding it on someone else's desk. So, you know, at the start, a few of us were wondering, why did we go to college to run around after CRFs? But <laughs> it did bond us as a team <laughs> for sure. So, like, if we look at the way things are now, it's very different than that. Yeah, it's you give me certain 
sort of post-traumatic stress uh, when I think <laughs> chasing those. And I, I think it's also even down to that process you mentioned of tracking. It's when I think about the number of people who have touched the FedEx envelope, who opened the FedEx envelope, who looked at the pages, who tracked the pages, there were so many handoffs in that process. And I'm pretty sure by the time the data manager saw the piece of paper, probably close to double digits of people had, had actually touched those pages in one way or another. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. As you, as you think about onboarding new people into the industry, how do you think they come in and it, what are their expectations? What are your expectations of them as data managers? I think to be fair, like people are getting to that sort of data manager lead role much more quickly. Like we had the luxury of a, a longer grounding in the role. So when we stepped up, you know, we had so much experience where you were like a deputy lead and, you know, you really understood everything end to end. And I think people are expected to, you know, just get to know everything quicker. And it's hard, like you need a bit of time for that. We had done in the past, you know, different graduate programs and, you know, they were great because you can really teach everybody the theory from end to end. But the problem is it doesn't, uh, training setting doesn't prepare you for the, the, the speed and the speed of everything at the moment, because you know, when I started, it was very straightforward data management. It was a little bit, you know, it, it was still called backend services. I absolutely abhor that term. And I think it's it's de it's almost dead now. Um, but if we think about everything that's been added on to the data manager workload, you're truly, a, a, you know, a, a functional lead within the team. You're involved in all the project meetings. You're expected to to do risk and issue management. And that wasn't there before. So. I think it, it, it's hard and, you know, I think if more universities, you know, did data management degrees and tried to, you know, help, you know, provide some of the workforce for the future, I think it would do us the world of good. Because to be honest, if you look during COVID, we were, every, the whole industry was running massive trials that needed huge numbers of CRAs, that needed huge numbers of data managers, and we all experienced a shortage. So even never mind the way we work at the moment, we could still do better to become more efficient, but we actually don't even have enough people in the industry. I mean, there's still a huge talent shortage and competition for talent. So, you know, I think we're going to have to try and prepare for that. If we can invest in an academy where people come out with those skills, they're going to make us better because they're going to come back with ideas saying, I wish you could do this. And that's where perhaps the next generation is even better at that than, than we ever were. Because I look at the way my soon-to-be six-year-old daughter solves problems and how quickly she's learned to use a whole variety of apps. She doesn't learn the way I did. It's completely different. Um, and I think we need to be investing in those academies to, to, to not only bring the next generation forward, but also we need to be preparing for whatever the next pandemic is, whether it's a variation of COVID or something else. We don't know what it might be, but we have to be prepared for it. And I think that's where we see the investment coming in. It sounds like you would be supportive of something similar as a, a global academy type of process. Yeah, I mean, some way to help, you know, prepare the next generation, because, you know, I think you're right. I think they're, you know, very knowledgeable about technology. But it's one thing, you know, knowing how to work TikTok and knowing different settings on an iPhone and actually being able to deal with an increasing number of technologies that we'll use on the clinical trial. And doing that in a way where we can be sure of, you know, it, you know, uh, efficiency. We are sure of, you know, accuracy, and you know, we can oversee the data flow. But, but also that we're not um, over egging our processes. That maybe we could argue that we've done in the past. Yeah. yeah. One thing, one thing you said that you can come back to. You talked about data management being kind of a, I wrote down a primary team member. That's an interesting thing because I think for me, over the last 10, 15 years, data management, I, th I think, has taken a back seat. I won't say second class citizen, but they weren't the first person you invited to a protocol review meeting. Now I feel like actually they almost are the first name on the team sheet. Is that is that your experience? Oh, totally. I mean, I, I feel... I feel like there's a vindication for all us data managers. I think everyone has finally understood how important this data is. And I think it's really changed. I could see over the last five or six years, 
I think also the OrbiQM processes where you had to start with a RACT and you had more focus on risk and issues made that cross-functional. Um, and I think that really helped bring us to the table earlier on because it wasn't just, you know, a project meeting where you're talking about, okay, what's STV status, monitoring status, data management status. It was changing the conversation to like, where are we with our risks? You know, do we still have the same level of risk? What are the issues? So I think that really brought us to the table, but I could argue that um, as an industry, we embraced OrbiQM and then didn't do it yet for data management. And I don't know why, you know, I think it's something that we need to do. And as, as I was saying earlier, the, you know, because of the shortages in, in, in talent in the way we're working, that should help be the catalyst to move us towards risk-based data management because we need to get there. We can't continue on the way that we are because it's inefficient anyway, and it probably isn't um, resulting in better quality data. How do you think as an industry, we are in that journey of actually realizing, you know what, some data good enough is good enough. Perfection shouldn't be the enemy for the good. It's sometimes what you have is what you have. Do you think we are learning that lesson or a long way to go? I think we're, I think we, you know, as I said, in the, in the clinical monitoring space, I think there was a huge acceptance of risk-based processes, you know, and I mean, you could argue that um, it, it, it did change the number of on-site visits that we need. So maybe there was a financial incentive, but I think everyone understood that it made sense because, you know, why would you STV 100% when so little data changes? It's pointless. And then in data management, we just continued on in the same way. And I think it's because a lot of us old timers are um, in more of those leadership positions where we are used to that standard of perfect. So if you if you are saying that we're going to move to risk based processes, there has to be some tolerance of errors for data that is, you know, not not important, but maybe less important. You know, the key efficacy safety data that has to be, of course, of the highest quality. But we treat every data point mostly with the same, you know, cleaning expectations and it has the same value when it when it doesn't. So I think we have to all try and change our attitude then because you know where I would like us to get to and I think everybody wants to get to is if you think about the data management process at the start we sit down we dream up every error that could possibly happen with the data we program validate you know run outputs look at those and try and find those errors when actually we need to get to a point where within EDC you obviously have the edit checks that drive the best data entry at point of entry um, and then beyond that, we have to use other technologies that will find signals, you know, find possible issues with the data. The technology will surface it. And then we, as informed, educated reviewers, will decide, is this a true signal or something else I need to investigate? And I think we've done that on the RBQM side and just didn't do it on the data management side. So I think for efficiency, for better data quality, we need to do this. But also it will help with this sort of talent problem because you know, the, the large trials that have been run over the last few years, like <laughs> they're nearly unsustainable to staff in the, the sort of old processes. So I think we need to change, but I think it starts at that foundational level where everybody within the data management space, space understands, right, we are going to accept risk space. We are going to have a certain tolerance of error, but obviously some data will have to be, you know, still perfect. Yeah. I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the things, I've been saying to people for a while is if you if you do go back in time, you know, when I started and we were bidding studies at Ceros, you know, the bid sheet for DM was really quite simple. How many data points per page? And it was normally 10, 15, 20. 10 is simple, 20 is complex, 15 is somewhere in the middle. But by thinking about that, all right, you might have 100,000 pages. But by thinking of 10, 15, 20, you anchor yourself to quite small numbers. And mentally, you're thinking it's quite a small digit and then you come to today where we're talking about maybe collecting a million or two million or 10 million data points per patient per day there is no greater spectrum for you to think about of why we have to be so different as an industry you know going from 10 to let's say 10 million per day that that is what we're talking about you can't sit here with a series of highlighter pens, post-its, and a load of listings and say that's how you're going to clean data. It's not possible. So I think you're right. We have to we have to embrace and change. And I think the technology is there. 
I think it's a, it's a mental thing, as you said. It's maybe there's a, a need to shake hands between statistics and data management, uh, regulators and data management, I don't know, and say, look, perfection is no longer exactly what we want, apart from in these data sets. In these data sets, perfection is essential. Yeah, exactly. And I think if I reflect back on those, you know, early trials that I worked on, you might have had one or two external data sources. There are so many now. Part of the job of the data manager is around overseeing data flow and trying to figure out if there are problems in that. And sure. um, because the sooner you can intervene, the more data you're going to be able to collect. So, you know, are there, you know, is the right technology in place to really allow us to oversee that if you have a complicated trial with lots of different sources or, you know, those hybrid tri type trials, you know, is, you know, you know, if you imagine like a dashboard, we can see whether, you know, the different sources are green or red, you know, you know, I think there are some systems that have some of that, but there's nothing pulled together in a kind of grand scale. And, you know, that's going to be more and more important as, you know, DCT and hybrid and, and all of that comes. Transitioning from a, a very large CRO to a very large sponsor company, you're what, six months into that transition, maybe almost. How uh, fourth, fourth month? <laughs> fourth month, there you go. How <laughs> how has that journey been? Um, any big observations so far, um, or anything you'd care to share with us? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I worked as a CRO for such a long time, and it's a really difficult decision to leave. You know. Of course, for, you know, CROs are great places to work. You learn so much. You work with so many different partners and worked with, you know, amazing people there. Um, but I just remember going to different bids and, you know, different people introduce each other and say, you know, oh, I worked at a CRO, pharma company, technology company, a regulator. And, you know, I, I just, you know, to me, that sounded really attractive to understand the different perspectives. And, the longer I stayed as a CRO, I thought, oh, the older I get, you know, am I really going to make this move? I said, right, be brave. Let's let let's do this. And you know, moving to a, a pharma company is is attractive to me because you are going to be much closer to the therapeutic areas, to the science as well. But also, what attracted me is at a CRO, while you have your own processes and solutions, you're also working with different partners. So you're kind of working on lots of different things at the same time. Whereas at a pharma company, you know, we're going to take this process and we're just going to work it to, well, I shouldn't say perfection, but, you know, get, get it working as well as we can and, turn, and just have a real singular focus. So that's, you know, kind of my next step for my education. So, like, it's been great. I mean, as I said, I moved from a European company to a European company. It's not majorly different. Um, and, you know, it's been great so far. Everyone's been welcoming. And, you know, it's, it's only my fourth month, but in a way, you know, it's flying as well. So within the, within the realms of what you can, uh, and I don't want to go anything too confidential, but maybe um, I can ask you, what are the big initiatives you're working on at the moment and what's kind of uh, drawing your attention in your new role? Sure. So we, there's a, a, a big project called Study Builder. This is, you know, is in public domain. Um, you know, we had a poster at Fuse a couple of weeks ago and, you know, it's really exciting. So Study Builder is basically going to be a, a system where you will have your metadata repository um, and then you are going to define um, your uh, define from the protocol all the way through data collection, you know, to TFLs in this system. So it's really going to, you know, enable uh, the use of standards across. And, you know, you could argue that we haven't really had that linkage with the protocol like in a system, you know, a mandated linkage all the way through to TFLs. Um, and while Nova has, you know, great standards and great standards usage, you know, this is really going to solidify it in a system and we're really going to get that end-to-end -end efficiency. Um, so, you know, it's, it's so exciting. It's going to really change the way th we work. But I think as well, you know, that's going to be the way that we are work in the future. And from there, we can add on different automation. So say, for example, we've defined the protocol, to find the CRF from there and then use an automation to build the CRF, you know, in EDC, you know, and, you you know, for every group involved, you have those different automation opportunities um, using a framework um, and, you know, using standards across. So it's hugely exciting. You know, we already have a, a first release out and there's, you know, aggressive targets for the next releases. So, so excited about that. It's going to be, you know, hugely 
uh, transformational in the organization. Um, and I think, you know, it is something that we can completely build on. And is your, is your motivation there, is that speed orientated, efficiency orientated, quality orientated, cost orientated, or all of the above? It's, it's all of them. It's absolutely all of them. Um, and then sometimes, you know, I look back over, you know, the last few years, right? So let's say we worked in paper, then we moved to EDC, and then we kind of did like, I'm kind of wondering what we did all this time because, you know, if we're talking about where we want to get to in the future, like we, you know, I know there are systems and solutions that have connected, you know, protocol and the CRF, but, you know, they're not, you know, generally or broadly adopted by absolutely everybody, you know. Um, so, you know, getting that linkage and getting that through the value chain, you know, is really important. And, you know, I think we, we can get there. I um, I spoke a little last week, actually, to uh, to, to Mark Drury from Bayer. And Mark, and I asked him my final question, which we'll get to in a few minutes, not yet, but um, I asked him if he had this magic wand and he said, I want there to be one set of standards that no one can argue with, no one can dispute. It's one set. Everyone has set it. It's agreed. Uh, and it made me think, you know, I guess my, one of my earliest memories of data management is talking about standards. You know, it was at GSK, or Black, so now GSK. It's about CRF standards, and it was actually the first conversation was, are we using American English or English English? And I'm thinking back to that level of conversation. And I think now, I'm not sure we've matured that far from that conversation. The fact that every company still has this passionate belief their standards are the best is in many ways, I think, hindering us. But um, it's exciting to see your work in this area. What do you think your high level goals are how do you quantify what you're hoping to achieve with the study builder project is it are you using the traditional kind of gateposts in terms of time from protocol to first patient first visit or are you reimagining kind of everything around the study design and go live process yeah i mean it, it, i think the timing is important we have a bit for takeoff initiative which is around really speeding up you know the the processes you know getting to submission quicker and i think everybody is trying to speed up absolutely but it's more transforming the way that we work instead of defining the protocol over here and then doing the crf and the tfls different differently and while we have a standardization framework between them you know it isn't you know solidified in a system um, and I think we'll gain, you know, amazing insights from this, you know, to easily be able to determine our standardization rate from start to end, you know, shorten the time frame and just really see where you are. Because if you look, if you're trying to step back and measure things and see where we are, you know, the more together it is in a singular framework, you know, we can gain insights that we don't even know yet. It's interesting. So I think um, one of the conversations we had with Vikas Galati way back in time when we started the journey here is, is things like, you know, as a data manager, database lock is our moment to shine. That's our big traditional moment. But actually, is database lock a significant milestone anymore? Everyone's focused on TLFs and first brought, brought data. And the more I think about it, it saddens me, but I think it's right. I think yeah. database lock is more of an interim milestone. So it'd be interesting to see how you define this process as we go because it's interesting it's, as much as i think data management and you said this very well early on you're now almost the first name on the team sheet in every meeting but we're also talking about maybe our milestone shifting or changing uh, we interesting to see how that all plays out but uh, we will look more for that but the other thing i want to pick up on there is you you mentioned very briefly about the end of the process and we said at the beginning you're feeling the pressure on both ends so the, the nice thing about the way you've described that is, I assume that your group are looking very much at the way we start a study will directly impact the way we finish a study. Um, is that is that true and is that how you look at it? Yeah, absolutely. Like we want to get to a point where, you know, the study is truly set up when it's set up. So when you get to the end, you know, the data is entered, it, the data has to go through the systems and processes but we don't have a big transformational step at the end. So we can massively reduce the time from the last patient last visit to the submission time. Um, you know, we could, we could all argue it's, it, it's too long, 
but I would I would also say that um, there is a lot of pressure on that 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 time scale. Last patient, last visit to submission. I do think there's more time at the start as well, like protocol to see if it kind of slows and then it speeds up and we want everyone to hurry up at the end, which we absolutely do. But I think there's more time saving at the start as well. well I totally agree. I think if you look at the cost impact, the rate which we spend money and where I think those buckets are, anything that can get first patient in faster is surely the biggest opportunity. Um, and we've talked in the past about getting down to a four-week build or a six-week build or whatever, whatever number is your target. And so often I hear, but, but that's not the critical path. I said, then make it the critical path. The, the, the situations I really love are where you've got different departments competing to not be on the critical path. You know, if DM get faster, clinical get faster. If clinical get faster, DM needs to get faster. That's, I think, where I think the future really lies and that's where i think it's exciting what you're talking about breaking down some of those traditional boundaries and tasks thinking differently and it means we will be i hope delivering studies much faster uh, which is going to be exciting for all okay i'm just conscious of time i've got a couple of questions uh, i want to get to my traditional final question but before then we've talked a little bit about some processes some initiatives some of the changes if you could uh, give guidance to, say, technology companies, are there things that you think are gaps? Are there things you, where you wish technology would help you more? Are there opportunities that you're looking for technology to, to support you? Yeah, absolutely. There, I think there's huge change, you know, in the technology space that, you know, that's needed to help drive us all to the next level. I think, you know, at this stage, everybody knows what processes need to happen. You know, we need to, we know what needs to happen at the start, middle and end of a trial. And the differences now in the future is what we can do with technology. So I think if we think about, um, you know, the different data sources and monitoring data flow and trying to find issues and, and, and challenges within the data flow, I think you could argue there, you know, there isn't a broad adoption for those type of tool sets as yet um, and I think we need to you know look even more forward as you mentioned those those trials where you might have personalized medicine we're not ready for that I don't think you know from a data management perspective I don't think anybody is really ready for that so I think you know we have to build a foundational layer like we talked about you know really trying to change the paradigm in the way that we you know review and uh, you know accept uh, data quality and I think building on from that is do we have an easy infrastructure that we, you know, we can take one of these really complex trials, be able to, you know, manage all the data, oversee it, oversee the data flow, oversee the quality, participate as that, you know, functional lead representing a very complex technology landscape in an easy way. Because uh, I, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. And I think um, we need more collaboration together with technology companies because, you know, it has to be a combined roadmap. I mean, you know the technology companies need to develop something that will be fit for purpose but we also need to advise on what that fit for purpose is so we can only go together so i think it's a really key collaboration for the future because i think you know in the past i think it's been a bit too separate and i think there's been a real trend over the last two or three years where you know we are really coming together as, as an industry and i think there is more of a kind of singular voice and you know, a, a, a roadmap being laid out on, on how, you know, we can move to the future. So I think we just need to continue more in that collaboration, but it involves everybody. It's CROs, it's sponsors, it's regulators, it's technology companies, because we have to come together. Um, you know, even if you took something as simple, like, you know, some of the processes, or you talk about the standards, like, we're all developing all these different things and we're wasting you know, effort by doing that. The more we can collaborate and share some of these resources, the more efficient it's going to be. I think for me, you know, we have to listen more, and, and, but also be prepared to say no. And I think that's one of the things that I think pharma should expect and, and demand of technology companies is to be realistic, is to be honest. I also think it's going to be incumbent upon us as technology companies to be more open on our roadmaps to share things to say this is what we're thinking um, and i think then it really will be a test of of all our relationships because we need people to be very honest and open with us um, and i think it'll be interesting but i see the signs of that 
uh, happening across the industry. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, me too. So, bunch of time. Uh, you know where I always end up. So bringing you to my final question, um, the, the concept of if I could put you in a scenario where I could hand you a magic wand, and if you could, you know, immediately solve two things that you can't do today, and also perhaps submit two things to room 101. So get rid of two things that you would never have to do again. What would you select? Um, okay, well, maybe like two things to put in the bin. I mean, you know, for example, we've all seen, you know, different uh, stats and data on, you know, edit checks in EDC that were programmed and never fire. And it's like insanely high. And like, what a sad waste of everyone's time, you know, to waste all that effort. And again, it's it's that trying to achieve perfection. So, you know, I think that's that's one of the things that I, you know, I would definitely like to see is that we're really adopting, you know, risk based approaches within data management. Again, you know, we're, we're trying to maintain the same data quality, but it's just, you know, on the right things and it's to enable us to scale and grow. Um, I think you could argue that, you know, data reconciliation is a bit painful and also a bit of a waste in some scenarios. I mean, yes, the data needs to be consistent, but, um, you know, some data sources are what they are, you know, and you can't kind of reconcile them. So I think, you know, trying to move away from those approaches and then looking forward to things to solve. I mean, you know, really those risk based approaches and, you know, having technology that will enable us to easily gather and oversee all the different sources that we that we have. I think as well, we're a bit insular as an industry. I think we could leverage leverage other industry knowledge like you know, the, the finance industry, you know, works with lots of large data sets and stuff. And, you know, they also need to be conservative, but I think they've done much more in risk-based approaches than, than we have. Um, and I think, you know, collaborating with IT groups and finance and, and, and maybe, um, you know, hiring people with more diverse backgrounds is just going to bring that diversification and thought that we also need. I like that. I mean, <laughs> Um, I like, I agree with it. I couldn't agree more about edit checks, never fire. I mean, it'd be, it'd be nice to not talk about it. I put that up with data standards. <laughs> Let's not talk about those things ever again. Uh, I think data reconciliation is the next big push. Again, I think there's a, there's a perceived need versus what the actual need is. So let's explore that. I do think risk-based approaches covers all of that, which is great. And I love, I would love to kind of put that word perfection into room 101 as well. Um, I'm going to wrap everything around that. And then I, I totally agree with you, other industries, you know, I bought my mortgage online or I signed up for my mortgage online. Why can't we do the same level of transactions in the same ease? And I do, I do have to look to the regulators for guidance there when it comes to local regional differences to do with signatures and what's allowed, what's not allowed. I think we have to realize this is healthcare. It really matters what we do, and we have to find a way to push through obstacles. And um, I think we need to be more successful at that. So I won't say I'll put the regulators in room 101, but I will say <laughs> I will like to think different before I get into too much trouble. So I'm very conscious of time. Where, um, our time has flown by today. I, I do want to give you the last word. So I would just love to say thank you very much for your time. Um, and I would love to give you the final chance to say, Anything to our audience uh, as closing words, any parting words of wisdom you might like to share? I think it's just continue to collaborate. I think the things that we've achieved as an industry together have been greater than everything we've achieved on, on our own. So the more we can collaborate, the more acceptance we will have of, you know, things that we want to change. So I think let's let's continue on that path. Great way to end it. So thank you very much. For everyone who's listening, thank you for staying with us. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I hope you will also sign up to listen to future podcasts from us as well. But uh, Rona, thank you very much as always. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. And I look forward to catching up soon.